Chad Lee from Chad Lee Photography, and this is Antihero Online. So you've been in the industry a very long time photographing some very big acts. But let's kind of go back to the start, and how did you get your start in concert photography? Well, there's, uh, it's, it's multifaceted, but when I was a kid, my mom, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, the home of Cheap Tricks, and my mom was, her best friend was Rick Nielsen's guitar tech. So as a kid, I was going to concerts like, to see Cheap Trick, and he worked for Kiss, not knowing, you know, that it was not unusual, and I always had a camera with me, whether it was a Polaroid, or a 110, or whatever, and um, as a kid, I mean, following that, I was always the guy that took pictures while, you know, your friends were over partying, or skateboarding, or riding bikes, and it wasn't until my late 20s that I realized it was going to be a career. So that's kind of where it started. I just always had a camera in my hand. And, you know, I think I saw my first cheap trick show. I was probably five years old, and I brought a camera, and I took pictures. I didn't know what was going to become of it later, but that's kind of where it started. And what kind of clicked with you that made you realize that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life? Oh, man. Um... I, at one point in life, my ex-wife and I used to own tanning salons, and I was a foreman on a construction crew. I built, I framed houses, big million-dollar homes in Chicago. And in the dead of winter, when it was 20 below zero, and it was 100 in the summer, I always kept thinking, with every time I pounded a fucking nail, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. <laughs> and I didn't know what it was, because I made good money doing it. But, uh... Somewhere along the line, Gene Simmons put out one of his many books, and he basically, you know, I took it as inspiration, you know. There's a, a kid that came here that couldn't speak English and conquered the world, and if you put your mind to something, you can do it. And that's kind of where the mentality started in my head, but you're familiar with, uh, you know, who John Five is, yes? Yes. John is the guy that pretty much set me along my way on my career 21 years ago. We used to trade kiss posters with each other, and I went and saw, uh, you know, I, I always took a camera with me, but um, just, uh, on a reunion tour, I had front row seats, I took some pictures, I was hanging out at John's one day, and, you know, this was before I had any inkling of being in the music industry or doing what I've done, um, I, I was at John's, and I showed him some of these pictures, and he was like, dude, you're really good at this. You should do it for a living. And I was like, right, how do I do that? <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, my, my buddy Niels Lothauer. And I was like, your buddy Niels Lothauer. I've had loads of pictures hanging on my wall since I was a kid. And that's kind of where John is the one that pushed it. Gene is the one that inspired it. I'm the one that went out and got it. And that's kind of, John helped me out, but I just kind of went, and that whole story is another, the development of that is, is, is deeper, but that's where he's going to set me on the path. And I just kind of went out and got it. And, you know, like I said, it, it goes, it goes further than that, which I'm sure you'll ask or we'll get into, but without getting too wordy, that's the gist of where that started. And that's, that's kind of a, a really great way to start because now you're a very accomplished concert photographer and he is a very accomplished guitarist he is and at the time you know he was playing for Marilyn Manson so a lot of my friends were like oh that's just that guy that plays with Marilyn Manson I'm like no if you only knew what a badass he is and so he kind of helps me along somewhere along the line I went I'm in a shot some shows uh, I, I started doing interviews much like this I mean I didn't know I just, I, I've always been a fan of music. And uh, I'll tell you, I did an interview with Zach Wilde one night. And, dude, we just, we, we fucking hit it off. And it just happens that way sometimes. And I shot some photos. I had Zach sign them. And he was like, dude, these are some of the best fucking pictures I've ever seen of myself. <laughs> Can I have these? And I looked at my buddy at the time, and I was like, well, shit, dude, that's all we brought. And he goes, bro. 
here's a fucking a laminate. Come back tomorrow night. Do whatever you want. And that night, he offered me a job to go out with him for a short period. And I said, man, that's, that's, that's amazing. And I literally thought to myself, holy shit, this is the movie Almost Famous happening right now. <laughs> but I said, I can't do that. One, I, I got to be on a job site on Monday morning. I, and Tuesday night, I got Rolling Stones ticket. He goes, dude, I'll fly you home so you can get to see the Stones. And so that whole trip didn't work, but that began a whole new relationship. And I started shooting Zach shows. I went out on OzFest with him in 2000. And that's kind of where everybody, because of working with Zach, I just started picking up work. And it wasn't out of, we hit it off. That's all you know, I could say. And, you know, one day, Kerry King was like, hey, dude, I don't see you up on stage shooting my band every night. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, Slayer's my favorite. I'm about to shoot my 180th Slayer show on this upcoming tour. Oh, wow. But yeah, I mean, they're my favorite band. Next to, you know, Kiss and Pantera. And, uh, I mean, it just, the next 20 years just kind of unfolded and very fast. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was, you know, not because I sat at home waiting. I can tell you how many people, uh, you know, there was a woman that lived next door to me in the beginning of my career that went to school for photography. And she was just annoyed as shit that I was getting the work that I was. And I'm like, yeah, but what are you wait You're sitting at home waiting for someone. I went out and fucking did it. And um, that kind of brings together what made me think it and how it happened. I mean, it got to be, at first, I was working my construction job during the day, working one of the tanning salons we owned at night, going to concerts afterwards, editing the photos. You know, I, I looked up who the publicists were, who the labels were, uh, searched the magazines. I mean, now, you know, everybody just, they want an easy answer. And somehow I figured it out and I busted my ass at it until one day I was like, shit. I got to quit my day job because I can't keep up with the career that I want. Mm -hmm. And I haven't worked. I've worked for myself for the last 18 years. And what was going through your head when you made that decision that it is time for me to quit my day job and pursue my dream and it my was, overall goal? It was exciting, but it was heavy, man, because my ex-wife was like, yeah, good luck with that. This is what pays our bills. And I'm like, this makes me happy. I didn't know where it was going to happen. I didn't know where I was going to come 20 years down the road. I really didn't. I just knew that I was enjoying it. I was having fun. I was traveling the world with my heroes and making, you know, new friends along the way. And I mean, to this day, you know, I see people, I'm sure you're part of some of the concert photographer groups on Facebook and yes, shit. Sir. Uh, and I see people all the time bitching about, well, I didn't get approved to do this, or I, or they won't let me do this, so I'm not going. Man, I'm still a fan of what I get to do. And somebody, the guy that gave me my very first paid job was uh, Jack Now at EMG Pickups. And he said, Ben, it's great to see somebody so enthusiastic. Never stop being a fan. Because when you're not, and you're jaded, and you think you're too cool for any of it, that's when it becomes a job, and you're going to hate it. I am still a fan of everything I get to do. It's easy to say. People don't like to read it. But it's true, man. When you put too much thought into it or too much hype into yourself or what you think you do, there's a hundred other motherfuckers that are waiting to do what you get to do and take for granted. Exactly. You know what I mean? And it's true. Now, I can look at it a little differently these days because, you know, yeah, I, I, I've done what I've done, and I, I'm able to say some of those things. But it's, it's, you know, it's still not easy, and it's no easier today than it was when I started. I mean, when I started, there was only a handful of guys doing this, and now there's 400 every night. And you know, it's no easier for me because I get that from folks. Well, yeah, but you have a reputation. It took 20 years of building those relationships to do it, and I didn't do it by suing people on Instagram for using my photo for $20. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had somebody recently just go, well, I mean, I saw it. Somebody used my picture and I'm going to sue them. You know, so I've been working with the disturbed guys 
since the inception. I mean, we all grew up in the same town. And, you know, they take care of me. But it's, dude, last year, when they, or two years ago, when they did their comeback, David shared a gallery of my photos on Facebook, <coughs> tagged me in it, and they crashed my website with over 4 million views and visitors in under two hours. Oh, wow. So do I sue them for using my stuff? Or do I send him a check and thank him for all the, the, the publicity? Exactly. And I can't get people to understand that. Pick and choose your battles. Don't go suing Guns N' Roses because they picked one of your, page, your pictures offline didn't know who did it. I mean, I understand the thought behind it, but you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I, and, and I mean, at that point, it seems like it's more of a... Uh... <clears throat> them wanting kind of like instant gratification and instant payment instead of kind of withering yeah. the storm and looking at the positive outcome of the whole thing. I mean, like, exactly. I'm still one of those guys oh. that will freak out when a band shares one of my photos. I'm like, holy shit. Does it, they does it shared freak you out me? and make you excited? Does it freak you out and make you excited? Or freak you out and go, man, I want my 25 bucks. No, it, it makes me excited. I, I, I almost shit myself every time it happens. Yeah, and you know, but and and so if you've built a rapport or a relationship, or you reach out to their public, just don't send out a cease and desist immediately, and then expect you know to get work from it following. Yeah. Hey, you might get the fifty bucks, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, but you word travels fast you. too. What's that? But word travels fast too. Exactly. And, you know, when I started and when, John, I mean, yeah, John was with Marilyn Manson, but he wasn't who people look at him now. John and I still work together to this day, 20 years later. I get to do things with John that, you know, nobody gets to do because we're comfortable with each other. Yeah. And I still respect the start he gave me. I mean, it's, uh, and people won't like to hear it and you shouldn't work for free all the time. But, I mean... If John asks me for anything, I'm not. My first thought is not, "Well, how much are you paying me for it?" He gave me my career. He didn't just hand it to me, but he opened the door. And it's one of those where you got to kind of pay your dues type things too. I mean, like you do. a lot of people. You do. And it seems like a lot of like upcoming um, concert photojournalists and journalists in as whole, they want to shoot right up to the top to you know Metal Hammer and Rolling Stone when. Everybody you know, wants to shoot ACDC tomorrow. Yeah. You don't get to. And not because I feel um, I deserve or because I get that too. Well, you know, you're just one of them old guys. Dude. No, I'm not. You just I didn't get to jump in and shoot Kiss right off the bat. Well, I did, but I had it again. <laughs> but I mean, you just don't get to go in and shoot Metallica tomorrow. Oh, and no. because they said you don't, you don't get online and go, well, fuck them. Why should they? There's a thousand people out there that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's that self-entitlement. Yeah. Just because you went out and bought a camera, you know, just because you bought a guitar doesn't make you Kirk Hammett. You know exactly. What I mean? And you, you just brought up a good point. Everybody can go out and buy a camera nowadays. How does that change the industry as it is as a concert photographer? I mean, when you said you said when you started, there was probably about eight guys. Now there's probably about five thousand people that are trying oh, to get yeah. into the same show. Dude, when I started in Chicago, the only guys I saw every night, and you may or may not know them, and this is another one that has come up. People do these things, you know, who's your top ten favorite photographers? And it doesn't make me old and ignorant to not know some of these folks to bring it up, but when myself and some of the other guys, you know, uh, Mike Savoya and, uh, you know, um, the, the evil Rob guy, people that have been around over 20 years, when we talk about, when I bring up Dean Carr or Ross Halfin or Niels Lozauer or Jim Marshall, and people go, well, I never heard of those folks. Dude, if you're going to be a baseball player, you know who Babe Ruth is, right? Yeah. <laughs> And that's what, so that has changed in, when I came up, I was still shooting film. And plenty of the older guys were like, dude, this digital is not going to last. Well, it has, but, you know, that instant gratification, dude, we didn't get to use to, you know, you went in with two rolls of film that you had to pay for, so you weren't just, as we call it, uh, trigger happy. You had to pick your shot. 
because when you were on a film, you were on a film. You didn't just get to look down and go, okay, that's good, you know? And you had to wait for it to be developed, or you had to have a dark room at home to do it on. So it, that has changed the whole everything, you know? Like I said, um, it doesn't make me or anybody that can shoot with film better, but, you know, when I stand next to a guy and I can hear a shutter going, click, 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 click. We, I, we call that spray and pay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and sometimes you got to do it, but, you know, I also, I, uh, well, you called it paying your dues. I mean, a lot of times now, I won't even go in a pit until after the three songs are done because I don't want to have to fight with a hundred people that aren't paying attention to who's around them or, you know, etiquette. So it's changed. It's changed a lot. I tell you, I shot, uh, Ozfest a couple of years ago out in San Bernardino. It was Ozfest, not Fest. Mm -hmm. And there was a young woman in her 20s. And are you familiar with who Ross Halfin is? Uh, Ross is a legend. Ross is a fucking legend. When we get off the phone, go look him up. He shot everything from the Rolling Stones and Randy Rhodes and John Lennon to he still travels with Errol Smith. I mean, he's a legend. And he was in there shooting. And this woman takes her 70 to 200 and balances it on Ross's shoulder. <laughs> and Ross, being who he is, like literally looked over his shoulder and was like, are you serious? And he made a way, he made a motion to a security guard and had her thrown out. At, backstage afterwards, I hear this woman bitching about, I don't know who that old fucking man thinks he is. And I'm like, he, that is the reason why you won't get, never have nice things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> And if that'd be like going up and taking the baseball bat out of Babe Ruth's hand, <laughs> you should follow. Yeah, I guess. And, that, and that's that's just some of it too, you know. Um, no matter if he was a crazy old man or a legend or not, have some respect for the people around you. Exactly, and that that's one of the things that I see a lot, especially in the photo pits nowadays, is. A lot of the concert photographers, they don't have the etiquette that they should have, or they no, they feel other. entitled. They they literally yeah. feel entitled, like they deserve that space that they have in there because they have a photo pass. And see, twenty years in, regardless of my resume, I'm still, dude. We get to be in a part of a show that no, you can't buy that. Oh yeah. You, I don't care how much money you have. You cannot buy a seat in the photo pit. Now, you might know somebody that can put you there, but so have some respect for the people around you. They're all doing the same thing. They're trying to do the same damn thing you are. And those are, I know, people are going to read this and, you know, come off like I'm a crotchety old man. <laughs> but it's not. It's, it's having watched it all take place over 20 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, when I came up, it was Gene Ambo and Paul Matkin. They were the only two guys that shows in, in, in Chicago. You may not know the names, but Gene Ambo has shot more Anthrax album covers than anybody else. Paul Matkin, he's the guy that shot the picture of Ozzy and Randy on the tribute cover. The blue and purple photo where Ozzy's holding Randy up and he by the legs. Yeah. Those are the two guys I came up working with. What? So I was the new guy, and it's, it's uh, you know, I'm appreciative of all of it still, you know? Yeah. If I don't get a ticket... So, I mean, if there's a band I go see, you it, it's just the three things, you know, three songs and you're out. I see people bitch about, dude, if I want to see a band, I'll still buy a fucking ticket. Exactly. And you brought up the three song rule. I mean, and when the three song rule was really established, there was, you know, film was a big, was the thing in the time and everybody was using flash. Flash forward to nowadays with the digital age and the three song rule and a lot of people complain about it. What are your feelings on it being still applied today? I'll, I'll tell you exactly where it started. It started way back in the day because they used to cover concerts in the newspaper. And it was usually the newspaper people or press that went out to cover a show. So you only needed three songs because if the show started at 8 o'clock, you had to get back in time to develop your film and get it out for the, tomorrow morning's paper because no one wanted to read about Led Zeppelin being in town last night on Saturday. Yeah. And that's where it came from. And, yeah, people, you know, you'll catch different aspects, but that's where it started at, because in you, how many roles are you going to pull off 
And, you know, some folks are not real, you know, you don't look as good as you did the first three songs. And that was the first idea was, you know, that's all the time they had. So where is it now? I mean, do I get to shoot full shows most of the time? Yes. But I'm doing something a little different. If if you can't get what you need in three songs, you, you know, have a problem. <laughs> I mean, it is. So and there's a handful of people that get to do that. And it's awesome. More and more people get to. But, you know, it's a distraction from the people behind you. It's a distraction to the people on stage because they want to look good. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. And I, I completely understand and I totally agree with it. I mean, if if you're shooting, we'll say Metallica, and they they've been on stage for two hours, nobody really wants them looking all sweaty and nasty at the last song. No, and if they do, it's up to a few people that they're comfortable enough with to go look. This guy is not but a picture with a, of me on stage with a booger hanging out my nose exactly. and you know blood under my armpit. I mean that's <laughs> you know. And that's, 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 again, a comfortability that some folks are just not going to understand. You're not going to make them understand. I mean, and it's still about the show, not about the, dude, there's 400 people just like us the next night and the night after and the night after. So, you know, again, it, it doesn't make me special or anybody else in that photo pit. You might capture a special moment, but you were still given the opportunity to do it. Oh, and yeah. it used to be, you only got sent out to shoot a show if you were on assignment. So if you were on an assignment, you did what you did, and if I had to sign over the rights, which I never have, it didn't matter. You got paid to do a job. Now people are, well, that, that's my property, that's my work, and I worked for it. Well, if you got paid $1,000 to go do your job last night, they, 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 that was your work. Yeah. You know, you can't, if you work at the post office, you didn't get to go, okay, I'm taking all the mail home tonight. You, you know? Yeah. And I know people will argue with me up and down about it and tell me I'm crazy, but, you know, I will be cocky, not cocky, but confident and say, well, look back at my career. I'm not crazy for it. <laughs> and you were talking about, you know, getting paid to, you know, photograph bands and do all that stuff. And I'm sure anybody who listens to this is a, and that's a concert photographer is wondering, how do you build that up from doing, you know, journalism and... Our Shoot. How are they going to do it now? Yeah. I don't know. Because when I started and I first went and asked Niels Lozauer and talked to him about it, 20 years ago, he said, dude, there is no money in this business anymore. Hopefully you have another job. And I did. Today, I really don't know. Because everybody goes in to do it for free. And why is anybody going to pay you when every night there's 30 other people willing to do it for free also? I am not sure how that's going to change. It's kind of like, dude, the whole industry. Who's going to buy CDs when you, they give it away online? Exactly. Now, some people have figured out a niche and ways to do it. And, you know, um, I'm going to be doing some, I'm going to be doing some gallery art shows this year that will also include talking about ideas on how to do, you know, how to make it and make a living in this business. But, I don't. I really don't know how that's going to change. And I feel for anybody that goes out and spends all the thousands of dollars for the gear and puts in the time. I don't know how they're going to get it back. I can again only thank the years that I had put in to still getting work. And a lot of folks, as quote concert photographers, that's all they want to do. Dude, you can go out to a magazine, a, a newsstand today, and look how many music magazines are out there versus how many dog magazines, food magazines, landscape. I don't, I haven't pigeonholed myself to just that. Have I made a name for myself at it in a career? Yes. But I do just as well shooting banquets and menus for restaurants. I mean, you got to go where the work is. Yeah. And you got to have that diversity in, as well. I don't do weddings. I, I mean, I do... <laughs> a couple a year, and I do them for my friends, and I do it for a set fee as my gift. I just don't. But, dude, there's a ton of money in weddings. Oh, yeah. But it's the same. People used to do that for $5,000 until people were like, well, I could do it for you for my for six beers in my iPhone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
you know, 15 years ago, people would want to buy prints. And I wasn't expensive as, you know, some of the folks I looked up to. But when I would tell somebody it was $100 for an 8x10, they would yell at me and go, well, I could make that for myself for a dollar. Sure, you can make a photograph. But that moment in time that I captured with my wisdom and my uh, education and and the camera gear and et cetera, you can print a photograph for a dollar to make it. You can't put a price on that. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, until... And there's, you know, there's just moments that you capture that can never be had again. And there's something to be said for it. But I encourage everybody to go out and do it, man. Go shoot for the stars. Shoot for your goals. And if you follow them, I hated hearing it when I was younger. But it's true. I, 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 I made a very good living building houses and hunting canning salons. But I wanted something else, and I got it. And I worked hard for it. And that goes again. Gosh, I feel like this whole thing is old man bitching about up and coming, but it's not. <laughs> Everybody wants something for nothing. They just want to hand it to them. You, you can't, you know? And you got to believe in yourself and go out and capture it. You know, just because you were there and did it with 14 other people, cool. Now, how are you going to market it? How are you going to move it? What makes you different than somebody else? Exactly. You mentioned being different than somebody else. How important is it to have your own personal style to the way that you capture the images and the way that you post-process the images? Especially nowadays um, when everybody has access to you know Photoshop and the camera gear, it's pretty much all the same now. It, it is, and what people do with it is, is, is sets them apart, and I'll tell you, I didn't know I had a style until people told me. I just went out and saw what I liked, and I knew that the same up and down photo or zoomed in on someone's face looked like everything everybody else did, and I mean, it is what it is. You, you can't make something that's not there appear outside of Lightroom and Photoshop, but you know what I mean? Like, um, when I started out with, with, with Zach, I was out, you know, 26 shows for a few years on OzFest, and I watched the other three guys or the other guys come in for their three songs, and they shot Zach the whole time. I was working with the guys, but I shot everybody, and I shot all of the people, not just, I, I thought outside of the box. I thought, well, hey, that's a different guitar company. That's a different drum company. That's a different string company. That's a different, and in that process, I started being told by other people, dude, I like your style. You know, now, whether it's because of the cameras or Lightroom, people take these amazingly crisp, still photos. I mean, I, I looked, before we did this, I looked you up to, to the first one, you know oh, who God. I'm talking to. Am I talking to a beginner? Am I talking to a 20-year-old? Am I talking to a 50-year-old? Am I talking... That's another one that people just don't give other folks the uh, the courtesy to look into who they're speaking to. Yeah. And, so, dude, you're the, the cover photo on your Facebook is one of those images. It is fucking dead on, sharp and crisp as can be. And that's maybe your style. Or, I... There's always, whether I try it to or not, there's always some movement in my images, whether it's the fingers. And I've had young, younger folks go, wow, this shit isn't that great. Look, this is out of focus. It's not always about that. And I had to find that out the hard way. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. No matter what they taught you in school, I was taking some photo classes. And I sold one of my images of a matter is not the name and whatnot. Uh, for five thousand dollars to a drum company, and when my instructor found that out, he said, "Dude, there's no need of you even coming to this class anymore because <laughs> you have already." But it wasn't because of what I had done. He goes, "You made more money on that shot than I made all month. That doesn't make you better, but I can no longer tell you what is perfect because." And so that's, you know, style, that comes, if you try to make it happen, it's not going to happen. 
you know, that'll be determined over the course of your career. But perfection, I would be older, which is an Italica song, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, somebody else might not see the same, the same beauty. Dimebag talks about it in Dime Vision. He goes, you know, I personally, it's like, I don't think that Bob Dylan is a good singer. Personally, I can't stand the sound of his voice. But millions of other people liked it. You know? Ooh. So I tell I would say to that, don't let style and influence what you're doing. Go and make yourself do what you like. And if if if, if you believe in it and you like it, other people are gonna like it. Yeah. And I and like that, I mean I did the same thing. I didn't know until a few years down that when people told me they liked the style of what I did. I'm like, I didn't know I had one. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think as photographers, we're completely oblivious to the fact that we do things differently than everybody else because, I mean, we're always studying our own work and trying to break it down and see how much better we can be. And we don't really, we kind of overlook it by trying to find the negative things that we can see in the images as well. Well, exactly. And I'll tell people from the beginning, man, I am my own worst critic. I think we all are. I think when people spend too much time, I mean, dude, processing is, that's up, that's a, that's a prerogative. But I think it's like, it's like in the, in the studio, making music versus documenting it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes under processing is better. Yeah. I mean, dude, I do, I do more than I ever used to, but, that was half of my style, you could say, was I didn't I didn't Photoshop shit, man. Yeah. I sent it out raw the way it was. And so did all the film guys before me. Because there wasn't Photoshop. Yeah. You couldn't remove you know, that mic to, stand. No. <laughs> you had to roll with it. And that's you know, that's uh here nor there. Some people they go way overboard on their their you know editing but that's what works for them and you know whatever I, again I, all I can say to that is beauty and perfection is in the eye of the beholder exactly. if you like it run with it exactly and I, I, I gotta thank you about that compliment about my work I greatly appreciate that I, I mean it, it is what it is and like I said I went purely out of I wanna know who I'm talking to cause like you know there was a I just it's it's come up over the years and and usually it's it's you know somebody that I give you the short scenario whether you put pause on this or not I had a young guy come up and you know ask why I get to do the things I get to do and he flat out was like because I don't think your work is any good and I was like you do that's your prerogative you're allowed to think that tonight I'm shooting Black Sabbath and. When you've shot 10,000 concerts and been published 1,500 times in 100 magazines, then come and tell me that my work isn't good. And I shit you not, the next morning I was like, God damn it, chop <laughs> under my skin. He made me be that guy I didn't want to be. But my first thought was, before this, when the guy hit me up on Messenger, I went and looked to see if he's 12, if he's 20, has he, is he established, is he new? Because, so that's what I did. And... You know, first thing I saw was, fuck, that shot on your fucking cover. I mean, I don't know who it is right off the bat, but it's it's crisp and clean as, as can be. And so, yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong with... Everybody thinks that we as photographers all hate each other, too. Uh, that is not true. No, oh, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, there's some competitiveness in it. And a lot of it stems from, yeah, us older guys and the younger guys, you know, but, uh, it's, if that's, man, good work is good work, and to shit on anybody, you know, you're just shooting yourself in the foot on that one, and, oh, um, yeah. there's nothing wrong with appreciating other people's work. And I mean, at the same time, we all kind of started from somewhere. You never know if it's a photographer that's just starting up. Or somebody that's been established in the industry for a long time. I mean, you could see oh. one bad shot, and it could be something that they took 15 years ago, and they're reminiscing about it, and you're like, oh, they suck. 
but you don't give them the time yeah. to look at something that they've recently produced. <laughs> well, for, personally, this one was it was <clears throat> some some disturbed photos that I shot, mm-hmm. and as I already told you in the beginning, dude, I've been watching that band since they played, <laughs> you know, at small places in Chicago, and have been in and around the camp and the family since the first album, and but that none of that makes a difference, but you know. You shit on my work of a band that gives me complete access to do whatever the fuck I want because they're comfortable and like me and my work. Now, because of that, you will probably never get the opportunity to, whether you know it or not. <laughs> and that's why I say never underestimate or look down on anybody. Exactly. Because somebody is going to be the next big thing and somebody is not going to be. And you know, to toot your own horn and and not appreciate other work, that's just shit in the eye of art right off the bat. Oh, yeah. And you never know, too, that it might be a band's publicist or tour manager that's in the pit trying to pull double duty, and you give them crap, and then you're done. Yeah. With, with that label, I mean, with that band. Know, this guy did not know that those are some of your friends, and I went and I took the name, right to Draymond and said, hey, make sure this guy never gets time to that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I actually didn't do that, but it was the other way. I mean, I mean, you just, you just don't shit on people, man. Yeah. And, and give the respect of who you're talking to. Like the woman, like the girl that rested her lens on Ross Halfin's shoulder. You know, you just saw some short old man, but what you did was you completely fucked yourself out of a lot of the bands that respect and love rock. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep. But before I let you go, just one really quick question. Out yes. of out of everything that you have done in your career, what is your greatest memory from all of those shows that you have shot? Oh God. <laughs> it's easy to go who's been the biggest asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like to do that either. Um, man, I honestly can't depending what day you ask me, it's a different <laughs> answer. I mean, dude, I don't know if you're familiar, if you've seen the photos that I did with what they call the triple threat. Yeah. Terry King, Jack Wilde, and Dimebag Daryl. Yeah. It's the only time those three guys have ever been photographed together. Wow. Well, what people haven't seen is the aftermath of that when we all <laughs> sat around and drank with Judas Priest. And, I mean, dude, nobody. Those are my three. Those are three of my dearest friends, minus Daryl, who's gone, who became who are three of my biggest heroes, and they've never been photographed in the same room. Wow. So, can I say that that was one of them? Sure. Can I say that the first time John Five and I ever talked about Kiss, which blocked my career, was the greatest? You know what I mean? That's so every day, it's different. Yeah. You know? Um, the reason I don't drink heavily when I'm working, because I know what it does. One of the most annihilated I've ever been on stage is the night I took the big picture, the famous picture of Daryl when he's smiling. I didn't know that that was going to go on to be on a million t-shirts around the world <laughs> or on the front of his funeral card. I mean, that was humbling as fuck. Yeah. When you walk into an arena with 30,000 people at your hero's funeral all in a daze and go, oh my God. I mean, this. So, you know, there's a lot of them. And, he, you know, I got to spend a month in the recording studio with the Dead Daisies last year and documented the whole thing. I would say that was just as cool as many of the other things because I was a fly on the wall and captured the pro- You know what I mean? Yeah. So, how about there's four of them? <laughs> <laughs> I can't just pick one. But, like I said, any given day, it would be a different answer. <laughs> 